Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at one verse today, Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. As we continue looking at the Beatitudes of Christ, which are contained within the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew's Gospel, it covers chapters 5 through 7. We're going to look at verse 4 today. Our Lord says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This second beatitude, Jesus says to those who mourn that they are blessed by God. That's what a beatitude is. It's, to, it's a blessing. And Jesus describes those who are in mourning as being blessed by God. And the particular blessing that Jesus says that he blesses us with in our grief and sorrow is we'll be comforted. I think the big question that we have to answer is who is Jesus talking to? Is it a universal promise for all people who are mourning that he will comfort them? And I have to say it's not. It's not a universal promise. And we know it's not a universal promise because of the context in which it occurs. The Beatitudes begin, again, in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew, if you want to look up a couple of verses, Matthew 5, 1 and 2, here, here's the context. This is the target audience. Seeing the crowds, he went up into the mountains. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. The crowds that followed Jesus certainly heard his teaching. But he was speaking directly to his disciples. And so the Sermon on the Mount is not just general guidelines on how to live in the world. The Sermon on the Mount is specific teaching on kingdom citizenship. What it means for a Christian to live in God's kingdom on this earth. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. And the Beatitudes which begin the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew 5 are directed to God's children. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, He's speaking about Christians. He's speaking to His children. Now there is a, a general sense that God blesses the world. He lets it rain on the just and the unjust. It's His providence over all things. Good things happen to all people. Bad things happen to all people. Sometimes very good things happen to very bad people. If there's anything good, it comes from God. The problem with the world is the world just doesn't acknowledge it. They refuse to. They refuse to look out and see the change of the season and look up to heaven and thank God for such a beautiful palette, and uh, which the world just goes on, ignores it, does its thing, and God is the one who should get the glory. But when Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, you know He's talking to His people. So this, if you're a child of God, should get your attention. We read last week in verse 3, and Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, because there's the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about what Jesus meant by that, was poor in spirit is one who recognizes their spiritual bankruptcy before God and turns away from their sin to faith in Christ. And they find a God ready to save them. In today's verse, we read, blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. What kind of mourning is he talking about? Well, we could ask one another, have you ever experienced grief? Have you ever mourned? Have you ever been so discouraged that you wished you would die? I think any of us here would say, yeah, I know what it means to mourn. Remember, it's so far away for some of us, me, to remember when you were a kid 
and maybe you didn't mourn a lot. Everybody that you knew and loved were alive. Man, the older you get, and some children know early on what it means to mourn, but the older you get, the more you lose in this world. Yes, we know what it is to mourn. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to everybody. People get sick and people die. Human beings do horrible things to other human beings. We misunderstand each other. We cheat one another. We talk about one another. Friends betray us. We know what it is to mourn. But Christians mourn over the same things that everybody else mourns because we're all living in this fallen world as fallen creatures. We've been saved by grace, but a Christian inherits other things to mourn that other people who don't know Christ know nothing of. Well, we, we know about suffering and death and loss, tragedy and crisis, depression, anxiety and fear, but we also suffer for Christ when we are persecuted, when friends reject us, not because they're just two-faced, but because of Christ. Well, I liked you, but you're a Christian, so I don't like you anymore. You find that you live in a world that hates Jesus. You find you, that, that you look around and you see most of the people you know don't follow Jesus. They don't like Him. Because He puts restrictions on them. They think He's, he's a, a killjoy. And we say freedom is being able to do whatever we want as we don't hurt anybody. Jesus takes that away. Not if you're saved. <laughs> it's not just taking things away. It's giving us life. It's reconciling us to Him. People don't like that. People won't like you. Jesus said if the world hated you, Him, it'll hate you. Only Christians suffer that kind of sorrow. But listen to Christ's words in John 16, 33, where Jesus says, In the world you will have tribulation. Now, he wasn't talking to everybody. Again, he's talking to his children. In the world you will have tribulation. And everybody here can say, Amen. Amen. But in that very same verse, Jesus says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It's just like grief for, for a Christian. Some, some Christians think you're not supposed to grieve. But Christians somehow are immune from feelings. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible tells us to grieve, but not hopelessly. So Christian grief is a transformed grief. We still grieve, oh yes. We know that when someone we love dies without Christ, we know what happens, and we grieve. And we also know that when someone we love who dies in the Lord, where they're at, oh, we still grieve, but it's transformed into joy, mingled with grief because of heaven. We know that. Now let's get back to, and, and before we get back to our text, Jesus tells us this so that we can have peace in Him. We won't have peace in the world. We have peace in Him because He's overcome the world. He conquered the curse of sin, which is death, by His resurrection. So, now back to our text. In Matthew 5, 4, is Jesus referring exclusively to the mourning his children experience by living, from living in a fallen world and suffering the common ills of all and the particular suffering of a Christian for righteousness sake? Is that what he's addressing here when he talks about mourning? I don't think he is. I think the context in which this is given, if we go back... One verse, when Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we interpreted those verses verse, as Jesus 
indicating our spiritual bankruptcy before God. If a sinner is convicted by the Holy Spirit and being drawn to Jesus Christ, they recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. They know that they are sinful and, and their sin is against God and they are estranged from God and that only Christ can, can save them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Recognizing your spiritual bankruptcy is what Jesus is talking about when He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. You go from spiritual poverty to Christ and spiritual wealth. Heaven. So I think those who mourn Compliment those who are poor in spirit. Those who mourn must be then those who are mourning in a particular way. Not saying that everything that we've said up to this point is not true, that we have John 16, 33 where Jesus says, He's overcome the world, you'll have peace in me. Yes, He meets us in our mourning and in our sorrows. Whether it's living through the sorrows of Bearing someone we love, being diagnosed with a terminal illness, losing a child. Christ is there to comfort us. And He's there when we're persecuted for His sake, comforting us, strengthening, strengthening us. But I believe here He's narrowed the focus down to those who are mourning over their sin And looking to Christ for strength and comfort. The context of the Sermon on the Mount in which the Beatitudes are contained, which the sermon actually begins with, are to direct us to Christian citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. What do Christians, how do Christians live as citizens of the kingdom of God on this earth? That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. And so I, I believe that verse 4 is addressing those who are mourning over their sinful state before God. Now, when we hear the word kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, we usually don't associate with it mourning, grieving, or sorrow. When we hear the words kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, our, we're, we're kind of lifted up into the, to the holy of holies of God's glorious heaven and look to that place where we will spend eternity. A place that is light. A place where the old things have passed away and everything is new. Glorified bodies. Seeing Christ. Seeing loved ones who died in the Lord. Seeing the folks who are in the Bible. Abraham, Moses, Peter, James. Most of all, seeing Jesus. We usually don't associate the kingdom of God with mourning and sorrow. But we must remember that we're looking at it from the perspective of being an heir to it. We forget in our joy that entering into the kingdom of heaven comes only through mourning of sin. And much that was said about poor in spirit would certainly apply here. The two are talking about the same situation. Those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy before God, grieving over their sin, crying out to Jesus to save them, and when they do, what do they find? Comfort. And the kingdom of God. Because God does not turn away a repentant sinner. When Jesus for example, came preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, he wasn't looking for people to rejoice. Hey, the kingdom of heaven is here. Here's the king. I'm the king. I brought the kingdom of heaven. Yay! Everybody's, yay, the kingdom of heaven's here. Let's, let's do this. The first message that Christ preached was, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He wasn't looking for people to rejoice. Yes, rejoicing in that the Savior has come. Sure. But He was calling the world to repent, to mourn over their sin and separation from God. In 
those who do will be comforted. That word comfort is the same word translated Holy Spirit. The comforter. The paraclete. Paracleto. The one who comes alongside and comforts. When a repentant sinner comes to Christ, mourning over their sin, they find a Savior who will forgive them and restore them. That's your first encounter with Christ. The recognition that you're lost. Separated from Him because of sin. Mourning and grieving that and crying out to Him. But your mourning doesn't stop. Living as Christians, as kingdom citizens in this fallen world will mean for us that we will continue to moan and bemoan continued sin in our life. Every time a Christian sins, there is sorrow and there is grief and mourning. And every time we sin and we grieve and sorrow and repent and cry out to Jesus to forgive us, He forgives us. He comforts us. He washes us clean. Every single time. And I have to tell you this. That the Christian life is one of mourning. Jesus was a man of sorrow. Yes, we, we should rejoice. Oh, the Christian should be the happiest person in the world. Well, if you mean we've got heaven and Jesus, there's joy there. There's joy that's deeper than any smile on our face or any rejoicing or shouting in church. It's a very deep joy. It's a satisfaction of knowing that we're safe. It's more of a thankful state. But if you're honest, it's hard to be happy all the time in this world. And there's not something wrong with you if you're not happy all the time. We are a people acquainted with sorrow, as Jesus was. How can you turn on the news and see what is happening in our world? How can you look at, into America and see the moral breakdown of a, of a society where right is now wrong and wrong is now right. How can you not mourn that as a Christian? How can I not mourn my own sin? And as we mourn throughout our sojourn on this earth, Jesus says, you will be comforted. So there is mourning and there is comfort. There is grief, but there is hope. And it's all building to that moment when Christ returns and does away with all the sorrow, the things that bring death and misery. Hear the words of Christ in Matthew 13, 41 through 43. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, notice, then after the wicked are removed, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. That's where the ultimate comfort comes and stays without any residue of sin and evil. We have much to mourn over. And we don't have to be stoic. And we don't have to go around shoulders slumped saying, oh, woe is me. 
In fact, Jesus tells us to, if we're fasting, maybe we fast because we're mourning. He says, get up, brush your teeth, comb your hair, put on clean clothes. Don't tell people that you're mourning. Don't tell people that you're fasting. In the sense that we are not to draw attention to ourselves. But let me encourage you to talk to someone. Another brother or sister in Christ. That you can go to and you feel comfortable with talking to. And tell them your sorrow. Not that they can fix it. But that they can go through it with you. They can pray with you. To know that you're not alone. Christians will mourn throughout the course of their life. We mourn over our sins. We mourn that our sins were born on the body of Christ on the cross. And yet we rejoice because He paid our sin debt. We mourn the harm that our sins have done to others. Most of all we mourn because our sins are against God. And Jesus comes into that and he says, I will comfort you. And it's all in anticipation of that great moment. When he comes and he wipes away all tears. You notice that? Let me read it to you in Revelation 21. 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Will there be crying in heaven? It would seem so at that first moment. What is God doing in that moment? He's wiping away the tears because that old order of things that brought those tears is no more. He goes on to say, And death shall be no more. You know why death is no more? Because Christ conquered death by His resurrection. What is death? It's the judgment of God upon sinners. If you eat of that fruit, Adam, you will die. Spiritual death, physical death. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We will mourn through this world. We will mourn because of the suffering that is common to all in this fallen world as fallen creatures. We will mourn the particular Christian kind of suffering. When people reject us and hate us because of Christ, we will mourn that. We will continue to mourn our own sin. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we're tempted day in and day out, and we give in to the temptations, and we sin against God, and we cry out from grief and mourning and sorrow, forgive me, God, and He does. And you know that one day... It'll all stop. The temptations will no longer come. No more sickness. No more aches. No more depression. No more missing loss. Because God Himself will wipe away every tear. So in this age, we will mourn. But in the age to come, we will be comforted. 
we close, let me ask you this question. When was the last time you mourned over your sin? How long has it been since you've cried out to God to be delivered from temptation? Woe unto those who do not mourn over their sin. For the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7.20, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Many are they who mourn over the consequences of their sins, but how many truly mourn that their sin is against God. For those who do, they have known the comfort of God. And they will continue to know the comfort of God. And one day, it will be all joy, unspeakable, as God wipes away the tears from the eyes of His children as they enter glory to receive their inheritance. Unspeakable joy awaits every morning Christian. I hope that you know the joy of the Lord. That in your days of sorrow, He is a constant friend. I hope and I pray that when you're tempted, you cry out to God for help. And that when we sin, that we cry out for forgiveness with a heart filled with sorrow because it is an offense to the God who saved us. Oh. Let's pray. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the one who died for us, bearing our sins before your wrath and satisfying your justice Thank you for him and his love who went to the cross to accomplish a redemption for a people given to the Father. Thank you for Jesus who died our death. Thank you for Jesus who was resurrected to give us a resurrection. Thank you for Jesus who comforts us in our sorrow and in our mourning. Thank you for Jesus who's coming again to gather his children, to bring them to the Father. Thank you for Jesus who saves us and keeps us saved. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who convicts us and draws us to Christ, who convicts us of our sins. Thank you, Father. Thank you, triune God, for this wonderful, marvelous redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. And eight. In number 283. Take my life and let it be.